from the previous movies, we remember that when we deal with power in AC steady state, we need to keep track of three different powers, apparent power, active power, and reactive power, and also of the angle between the voltage phasor and the current phasor, the power factor angle, and besides that, of its cosine, the power factor. When Charles Proteus Diamonds took a look at those three formulas, he thought of a mnemonic, a triangle to remember them by, a right triangle. On the hypotenuse, he wrote the apparent power VI. The angle with the horizontal side, he used the power factor angle. And I ask of you now, remember your high school trigonometry, remember Sokatoa. What is the length of the horizontal side? Oh, that would be hypotenuse multiplied by the cosine of theta, right? But that is active power. And what is the length of the vertical side? That would be hypotenuse multiplied by the sine of theta, that is Q, the reactive power. So he has found, Steinmetz has, a nice graphical way of representing the relationships between apparent power, active power, reactive power, and the power factor angle. That is called the power triangle. For an inductive load, theta is positive, Q is positive, and the triangle looks just like that, right side up. But for a capacitive load, theta is negative, Q is negative, and that triangle will appear upside down. Next, Steinmetz looked at the power triangle and thought, I can store all of those values in a single complex numbers. I can store the apparent power, the active power, the reactive power, and even the power factor angle, all in a single complex number. Really? Yes, this one. A complex number with an absolute value as the apparent power, and with an argument that is equal to the power factor angle. Hmm. Well, I see that in your complex number, there is S and there is theta. What about P and Q? And he responded, if you write that complex number in rectangular mode, then you see P and Q. P, the active power, would be represented as the real part of the complex power, and Q, the reactive power, would be represented as the imaginary part of the complex power. If that is not genius, I do not know what to call it. However, that had an undesirable side effect, and that was that naive students started calling Q imaginary power. And those students eventually grew up, they wrote textbooks, and those textbooks contaminated all the people across the planet into believing that Q was imaginary. But no, that is not so. Q is not imaginary. Q represents very real energy traveling in very real time. Q is a real power. It only happens to be represented as the imaginary part of a complex number, but even so, in mathematics, the imaginary part of a complex number is a real number. You don't believe me? Check this out. Let me enter that complex power, SX3 plus 4J. Let me ask the calculator that was programmed by mathematicians what is the real part of that. I get a real number 3, no surprise. If I ask calculator, give me the imaginary part of SX, I get 4, which is another real number. So you see, the imaginary part of a complex number is a real number. Q is a real power that is represented by the imaginary part of a complex number. Q is not imaginary. Please, in my classroom, never ever call P real power or Q imaginary power. In your classroom, you humor your professor. All right, he's the one who's grading you. But in your heart of hearts, you know better. Because both are real powers and because, come on, you are my student. Even if you're on the far side of the planet, you are also my student. Charles Proteus Diamonds thought, is there a way I can compute the complex power directly in a single operation? And then he said, yes, I think so. Look, the complex power is S theta, right? But S is apparent power, S is VI. That's right. And theta? Theta is the angle between the voltage phasor and the current phasor. That is alpha minus beta. That's correct. But that is the multiplication of two complex numbers, V alpha and I minus beta. Yeah, V alpha is who? V alpha is the voltage phasor, and I negative beta is the complex conjugate of the current phasor. What a beautiful, simplified, and compact formula. If you know the voltage phasor at a load and the current phasor at a load, you multiply the voltage phasor 
by the complex conjugate of the current phasor, and you get complex power absorbed by the load. Active power, reactive power, apparent power, power factor angle, everything in one single operation. If you apply that to the generator, then you get delivered complex power. Let me make a comment on RMS versus peak value. Observe that in all these part formulas, V is RMS volts, I is RMS amps, and the phasers are RMS phasers, the standard for the power industry. V is RMS and I RMS, right? And then we have the formula for apparent power, for active power, for the reactive power, and of course, the computation of complex power. However, if you insist on using peak valued phasers, nothing wrong with that. But you only have to remember that if you're saying that V is the peak value of the voltage and I is the peak value of the current, then your formulas need to be divided by two. And that is all. Tutorial time. It is the same exercise that we began solving in the previous movie. But this time the question is, compute the complex power at the source. Oh, that's easy. That is a voltage phasor, this one, 480 with 30 degrees, multiplied by the conjugate of the current phasor, where is the current phasor? Here, 80 amps with 4.5 degrees. Multiply this phasor by the conjugate of the other, and we have those numbers stored in the calculator, right? So the complex power of the source is the voltage phasor Vs, multiplied by the conjugate of the current phasor that is also stored in the calculator, and look what you get. You get a complex number that is a complex power, Absolute value, 38,000. Angle, 25 degrees. Who are they? 38,000, that is the apparent power. 25 degrees, that is the power factor angle. What kind of load is that? Well, theta is positive, 25 degrees. So uh, that load is inductive, right? So we say the source delivers 38.5 kilo volt amperes at a power factor that is the cosine of the angle, cosine of 25.5 inductive. But we don't stop there. If we ask the calculator, show me the number in rectangular mode, oh, fine. The real part is 34,700 watts. And the imaginary part is 16,600 VARS. The source delivers 34.7 kilowatts, that is P, and 16.7 kilovars. So you see, with the units we're using, we don't need to say apparent power, active power, reactive power. We just give the unit. I suggest that you take a break before we continue. You did? Let's continue. Let's talk about the relationship between the power factor angle and the impedance. Check this out. We have a voltage, that one. We have a current, this one. If we represent those voltages and currents by phasors and divide them, we get the impedance of whatever load we have, like so. And your question, um, does it have to be a peak value phasor or an RMS phasor? It doesn't matter. You're dividing. The root 2 would cancel out anyway, right? When you find that impedance, you realize that the argument, the angle of the impedance, is theta. The argument of the impedance is the same power factor angle. So when you have a load represented by an impedance, the argument of the impedance automatically is giving you what is the power factor angle of that load. Let's say that is the impedance of a load. Well, you'd say that is an inductive load. This is the resistance part. This is the reactance part. The angle theta that we know in advance is going to be the power factor angle is positive. It's inductive, all right? So when the time comes to draw the complex power, it's going to look like this, the complex power. It's going to have exactly the same angle with the real axis. And uh, then the proportionality with P and with Q is going to be the same you have between the magnitude of Z and R and X. And what about this? That is a capacitive load. The reactance is negative. The power factor angle is negative, right? And the corresponding complex power, it looks like that. So the reactive power is negative. The power factor is negative. Absolutely. Let's have a look at these inductive and capacitive loads. What is that? That is the power absorbed by a certain load. This is the real axis, the active power axis. What kind of load is that? Well, that load is absorbing some active power P. We can see that. That load is absorbing some Q, reactive power Q. Yeah, that's right. So that is uh, an inductive load. Yeah. What about this load? Oh, that load is more inductive. It's absorbing less P and more Q. What about this one? 
where this load is absorbing no active power, is absorbing only reactive power. What is that? That is a pure inductor. Pure inductor, huh? Yeah. And this load? That is a pure resistor. It's absorbing only active power and no reactive power. That has to be a resistor. And this load? That is a capacitive load. That is absorbing some positive active power and it's absorbing some negative reactive power. It's delivering power. It's a capacitive load. And this one? A more capacitive load. And this one? A pure capacitor. A what? A pure capacitor. Ah, okay. Let's have this uh, silly example. Let's say that a dad takes his three kids to the shopping mall. The kids are A, B, and C. Each one of them gets some money from dad. A gets $10, B gets $20, and C gets $30. And they go shopping in three different directions, right? Dad sits comfortably at a Starbucks cafe with a mug of hot chocolate. Every hour, on the hour, all through the day, they return to dad for the same amount of money and they disappear again and the cycle repeats itself every hour. It does not matter where they're spending their money. A is spending $10 every hour, B $20 every hour, and C $30 every hour. Dad is the generator, is the source, the battery. He's providing 10 plus 20 plus $30 every hour to those loads. The geographical location of the stores where they're shopping does not matter. It is the same as having a generator and three loads. It doesn't matter where they are geographically. One is absorbing 10 joules every second, the other 20 joules every second, and the third 3 joules every second. The generator has to provide all those joules every second. You add them up. So you have three loads, one of them is absorbing some active power P1, some reactive power Q1, and another load on the third load. When you add them up, you get what is the power that the generator needs to provide. PT, joules per second of active power, QT, joules per second of reactive power. We could represent the three loads with complex powers like this, right? And still, you add the three complex powers, and you get the complex power that the generator needs to provide. Let's do this graphically. There, we have three loads. We need the hats. There are the hats. Three complex powers, right? Well, you add them up, the three loads, and you get ST. That is the power that the generator needs to provide. The first load is inductive. The second load is capacitive. And the third load is inductive too, but less inductive than the first one. And when you add them up, you get that the generator is seeing a big inductive load. Less inductive than the first load, but more inductive than the second load. Here's some homework for you guys before you go. Prove that for the resistor the reactive power is zero and that you can compute the active power with these simple formulas. Ri squared, V squared over R. Who are they? I is the RMS value of the current through the resistor. You multiply that. If you have that value, you square that and multiply that by R and you get P in watts. Or, if what you know is the RMS value of the voltage in the resistor, sure, square that, divide by R, you get P, the active power. Q is always zero in the resistor. Prove that. Prove that for a reactor that is an inductor or a capacitor. The inductor has a reactance omega L. The capacitor has a negative reactance, negative 1 over omega C. The reactances are real numbers, guys. Remember that, right? Prove that the active power is zero and prove also that you can compute the reactive power in a reactor with these simple real number formulas. If you know the RMS amps through the reactor, reactance multiplied by S squared. If you know the RMS voltage through the reactor, V squared over the reactance. More homework. Prove that if you can represent a load with a complex number Z with a hat, you can compute the complex power in that load with this simplified formula. If you know the RMS amps, or with this simplified formula, if you know the RMS of volts. I will not leave you guys without a word of advice. Go and find out what is power factor correction. I've made a movie for that. Consider this scenario. You have a customer that is absorbing 100 million volt amperes, 100 MVAs, with a power factor 71% inductive. If you draw the power triangle of that customer, it looks something like this, right? 45 degrees, 
P and Q. That customer is absorbing as much active power as reactive power. That customer is playing a lot of ping pong with the generators, right? That is not good. The customer may think that ping pong energy is costless. It doesn't cost. I'm not keeping that. I'm returning that to the to the generator, right? They shouldn't charge me for that. But no, that traveling back and forth between the generator and the load costs a lot of money to the power utility company. That's why in the contract, there is always a low power factor penalty clause. Why? To convince the customer that is in his own benefit to make sure that the power factor is not too small. How is that? He needs to correct his power factor. That technique, power factor correction, deserves a whole movie, which I made, and I point you in that direction. Go to that link and find out what is power factor correction and how that's computed. To end this session, let me direct you to a problem that adds up everything we've talked about in this movie the solution of a quintessential electric power system. For that, go to my movie at this link. That day I had pneumonia, so I wrote the script for my daughter. And that is all my invisible friends. So long, and thank you for all the fish. <laughs>